Welcome to the Haunted Hacker Podcast, episode July, volume two. This is my second one this week. A uh, little bit of news before we get started. The Haunted Hacker uh, Podcast spun off into a nonprofit now, uh, which is called Hackers for Vets. And we just received our first donation and opened up submissions uh, starting July 5th through, I believe it's November 1st. Uh, and for any veterans that apply, the award is going to be ten thousand uh, dollars to get certifications or education or books or whatever you need to get you started in cybersecurity from the military. A uh, little bit of news on the speaking front: I'll be speaking at CloudCon uh, in Western Michigan in a couple weeks on the twenty fifth, I believe. Uh, so look forward to that. Also follow Aaron Bregg. Um, he's the one that's organizing this with a, a group of people. Uh, today, we have a really cool guest on the show, uh, Mark Hoffman. He and I spoke together at a conference and uh, had a lot in common and really found each other's talks really super interesting. Uh, I won't spoil Mark's background. I'll let Mark talk about his background and, and kind of what he does, and hopefully you'll find it as fascinating as I do. Mark, it's a pleasure having you here. It's a real honor. Thanks for having me. All right. So just to introduce myself, I'll give some information about uh, my background. Originally, I'm a business psychologist, but at a very early stage, I became interested in the dark topics. What do I mean by dark topics? Well, in business psychology, it's things like narcissism, white collar crime and psychopathy, which also plays a huge role, not just in, in violent crime, but also in the corporate world or when we talk about white collar crime. I mean, Especially since the world financial crisis and some other big scams and, and crisis um, and also now the war we are currently in, the awareness for dark personalities, not just committing violent crimes, but also being active in the corporate world or, or even on government levels um, is now much higher. So these are the topics which, which interested me first. I did then my training in the United States in different states as a crime and intelligence analyst. So profiling is a much more easier term to explain what it is and people understand what profiling is all about. But in, in the professional world, nobody really calls it profiling. It's more called like crime analysis or crime and intelligence analysis. And, and this is much more realistic. So it's a process um, of analyzing data and it's not about magic or intuition. So I like to call myself a crime analyst, but if you want to call it a profiler or a profiling expert, then I'm also fine with that. And now I'm doing my PhD, which is a comparative analysis of the profiles of psychopaths in the corporate world, violent criminals or psychopaths, and also cyber criminals. And this is a very interesting field to compare these profiles. And I'm, I'm not just talking theory. I try to meet these people um, in person and I try to conduct scientific interviews to, to learn more about their profiles. So I meet corporate psychopaths. I meet violent criminals in prison, but I also try to meet cyber criminals as often as I can to learn as much as I can from the internal perspective. And then what do I do as a, as a profession? So I offer like consulting services, workshops, keynotes, when we talk about these topics, because I think I can offer some insight by not just talking theory, but by saying, well, I can give you some insights, what, what hackers or cyber criminals told me themselves. And this is for companies much more interesting to learn who, who are these people? Why do they do what they do? And how do they choose their targets? For me, learning from the inside is a great privilege and a very unique perspective. And, and that's what I'm actually do. So I offer like cybersecurity awareness, um, uh, speeches, workshops, and consulting services to, yeah, to, to inspire people a bit for the topic of cybersecurity. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That, your talk uh, out at the conference we both, the virtual conference we both attended was, was fascinating. Uh, I think Thank we both have a, have a passion for um, trying to figure out the dark minds because I, in my opinion, you know, I, I try to follow and try to research as much as possible some of the scariest and some of the most evil world leaders or powers that we've seen in history. Right. Um, not only because it just fascinates me, the, the mindset and, and why they did the things that they do, but 
the, the whole idea of the charisma behind it, some of these powerful people, some of these evil people were able to manipulate millions of people in order to create, you know, get to an end. So tell me some of the interesting things that you've ran into while doing your research and, and, and while interviewing some of these, these criminals. It's totally fascinating. First of all, one of my main learnings over time is the following. At first, when you get involved into the profiling stuff, at first you might think that serial killers are the most interesting guys out there, right? Because they are committing the most brutal crimes. And in Hollywood, they are always portrayed as very clever, charismatic and intelligent, sometimes businessmen. Think of American Psycho, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hannibal Lecter. They all have a doctoral degree or are successful businessmen and serial killers at the same time. No reality is different. I can tell you that there is nothing, absolutely nothing fascinating about serial rapists and uh, many terrorists and then serial killers. They are not as fascinating as Hollywood um, makes us believe. So this is really just an, an urban legend which makes movies more interesting. I mean, imagine they would catch the idiot after two days. It, it would not be an interesting Netflix series. But if you have a very intelligent mastermind killer, it's much more interesting. But this is not reality. So the average intelligence or IQ of, of serial offenders is lower than, than the average in general society. And there were some exceptions. For example, Ted Bundy, everybody's darling, one of the serial killers. Well, even Ted Bundy, which is like the prototypical example for, see, there are intelligent serial killers. Well, if Ted Bundy is the most intelligent one, you don't want to see the other idiots. So he was not that clever. I mean, they, the way he committed his crimes and how he chose victims. And let me maybe put it like this. If he would be that genius then they would have never uh, uh, got him, right? So, so per definition, the ones that you're catching are not one ahead and they are not really outsmarting the FBI because otherwise they, they won't get them. So to put it in a nutshell, in the beginning, I was also fascinating, fascinated by these guys, but reality taught me that the intelligent people can be found in, in the world of white collar crime and cyber crime. Here, you really have some, some very interesting people. And what fascinates me the most is the fact, to a very large degree, when we talk about financially motivated crime, they do it for money. But if you look into their bank accounts, you can see that many of them are multi-Bitcoin millionaires. So for me, for, for me it's, it's too simple to say, well, yeah, they do it for money. Well, if you have 100 million in your bank account and you commit crimes to get another 100,000 bucks, then it's not about money. It's more about greed Great. or a challenge to beat the system or whatever. So to, to put it in a nutshell or in one sentence, if stupid people commit crimes, people that need money and have no other chance in life to get money, well, then it's not that fascinating. It's, it's the only way they can ever get a huge amount of money in a short amount of time like right. bank robbery and that kind of stuff. But if people have enough money and are very intelligent, they could work for Google, they could work for any Silicon Valley company, but they choose to, on purpose, they choose to go to the dark side and commit crimes in, in many cases. And that's for me much more fascinating now and much more interesting. So the most interesting conversations, I had them with people in the corporate world and with uh, some cyber criminals or, or hacktivists which are not in all cases committing crimes for money, but but these these people or guys are much much more fascinating for me than violent criminals. Yes, I I, th I think that they're a lot more calculated too. Um, we talked about yeah. financial motivation. You know, I've seen it on both sides. I've seen where someone is is motivated by money at first, and then becomes greed, and the, you know they're multi billionaires or millionaires. Um, and then I've seen the super poor that go after you know, banks or, or, or financial means and get a little bit of money, but those people end up blowing it so fast and going right back to the crime. Um, right. usually, the, usually those people are driven by, you know, socioeconomics or some sort of, of, of drug uh, or alcohol abuse or, or dependency. And once they get right. into that lifestyle of stealing and, and, you know, that rush, then it feeds their addiction. They grab the money, they go blow it and they're back at it again. 
Um, and in both cases, I think both criminals are equally a threat, really, because the one, the, the poor one is going to be more persistent. The one mm -hmm. that's rich is going to go for higher and higher bounties, so it poses more of a risk. It, that's my personal opinion. I, I, I don't know how you feel about that, but that's kind of the, the way I did, you know, thought about it in my mind, and, and it makes sense to me. Is, is that somewhat on the same page? Right, absolutely. So you said a very interesting uh, word, which is addiction. And I think in, in, in many cases, especially in the world of cybercrime, it can become an addiction, pretty much like gambling, because it's 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 also, see, for many, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but for many hackers, it can be black hats doing it for money or, or financial gain, but also for some hacktivists hacking like, like it's, it's also a challenge. It's an intellectual challenge. And, and th this is what all humans like, basically, in life. We like to have a good challenge. We like to win. And we like to outsmart others in, in some cases. So that's, it, it's also a game. Mm -hmm. And a little bit like gambling for, for some of them, yeah. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. I went to a, uh, a research project in Sandia National Labs for the Department of Energy and uh, Department of Defense. And one of the ways that they, they measured the biofeedback was they put us hackers behind these monitors to hack these virtual SCADA networks. And while we did that, they watched our eye movement, um, keystrokes you know, through the webcam and the keyboard. And they had a, a, a wristband that measured perspiration, pulse, right. all that stuff. So they could see the biofeedback from when we would actually break into a machine or, or a network. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the chemical response to the body, once you're able to achieve that, is almost the same as an opiate. It gives you that same euphoric feeling, and it's very short-lived, but it's very high, you know, it spikes pretty high. So right. it, they think that a lot of us go after that, that same feeling over and over and over again. Right, yeah. There's also, I mean, we can talk about this classification in pretty often when we talk about um, profiling and, and hackers, pretty often the three categories. I don't like them, but anyway, the three categories are like white hats, black hats, and gray hats. Like white hats, the security experts or hackers on the good side of life, so to say, working for, for companies or whatever, if you consider this the good side, which is right. also a perspective. <laughs> and th then we have like the black hats doing it uh, for money and financial gain. And and gray hats are, in my opinion, the most interesting category because they are somewhere in between. So in many cases, they are committing crimes, but not they are not always or, or primarily motivated by money, but they oppose authority. And they, do, they these are the hacktivists or do it for ideology. Um, for example, I mean, Anonymous is exactly that. Like in, in many cases, now we saw an Anonymous um, hacking uh, Russian departments and, and stuff like this. That's pretty interesting. If bad guys are hacking other bad guys, or for example, didn't Anonymous also hack uh, ISIS at, at some mm. point of time? Multiple right? so, accounts, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's pretty much like, like the TV series Dexter. It's a serial killer killing serial killer. So right. from, from an ethical perspective, you could ask the question, well, isn't it a good thing then? Well, interesting question. Of course, it's also a crime. Whenever you you penetrate another system or steal data or, or whatever but this is um, a different motivation the reason why i don't like these categories is in my opinion you can't really draw a line or the boundaries between these categories are blurred in, in some way tell me one brilliant white hat hacker that really has extraordinary skills in hacking that didn't do any kind of criminal activity at some point in life maybe when he was 14 or whatever like, so you can't really learn these skills if you're not at one point of time in my opinion cross a line and even if it's just spying on your classmates but at, at some point in time you don't learn or develop these skills if you don't cross a line because i mean where did you learn it did you learn it in school no you did learn it on youtube on the dark net or from some indian youtube tutorials or whatever but not in school right Right, right. You, back in back when I learned how to hack, I, I don't think we, we didn't have the internet back then. Um, and the systems that we're breaking and manipulating weren't even connected to networks yet. Um, we're talking like Windows 3.1 and like looking at the different protocols and right. trying to figure out how things work. Uh, but like, re like really truly hacking, you know, I, I hate the classification too. 
Because there's one thing that black, gray, and white all have in common, and it's opportunity. So I, I look at the, the separation between the colors of the hats is the separation between being opportunistic and not. And by, the, by, by saying not, let's, let's take the white hat hackers, for example, that, that would not want to break the law. But here's the deal. Given, the, given certain circumstances, any human can be bought. Any human can be persuaded depending on what the outcome is and what the risk and benefit is. If the risk outweighs the benefit, then it's no point. But as a white hat hacker being approached by other people, they mm -hmm. usually make that, that pretty enticing. So really it's just opportunity, I think, is what separates the three and the ability to, so I, I don't want to say control yourself, but the ability to forward think enough and reverse think back to the mistakes you've made in the past, I think that that method of thinking is what determines a white hat, gray hat, and black hat given any specific opportunity. And that's just from my point of view. Right. So, so do you think, and that, that's interesting because um, also when we talk about other forms of crime, there were some people arguing, well, every human being could become a murderer. It's just a matter of context and in, in what situation you are in. Most of us would say, no, I would never kill a person. But the question is, what if, if your child has been raped and you meet yeah. the offender in court And he says, well, I did it because it was fun and spits into your face. How would you react? I think none of us can really predict how we would react in this situation. So I agree to, to, to some degree. I agree that, that it's just a matter of context or opportunity, what people are, are able or capable of, of doing. But do you think that, um, that every person could commit crimes or become a criminal if, if it's just a matter of opportunity? Because I would say about myself, well, even if I would have the opportunity, if, if you would offer in a, in a theoretical context, if you would offer me an opportunity to steal a million dollars without ever being caught because there is no way to ever trace it back, I think I won't do it. Well, no one offered this opportunity yet to me. So, but but um, I, I think it's not just a matter of opportunity, but also a matter of, of ethics or, or conscience, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it, with cybercrime, it's so different too, because the lines, the, the lines that lay out the laws for cybercrime are not very clear either. So you have the difference between white, black, and gray hats being kind of muddled. But then again, you have what's legal and what's illegal when doing things on the internet and looking at different systems and accessing systems right. is very muddled as well, depending on the situation or who the law is trying to bring in. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a lot of very not clear boundaries um, between, you know, just not only cyber criminals, but what exactly is a cyber criminal. And that's something that we've struggled with, I think, since the beginning, the inception of what we consider, you know, illegal and legal on the internet. Um, back in 2008, I was in a documentary called Hackers for People 2, and I was speaking about um, why I was so frustrated about the, the cyber laws that were coming out back in 2008. And my, mm -hmm. biggest, my biggest complaint was you had people in Washington who had never touched this technology, had have no idea about this technology, making laws regarding the access of that technology. So, I yeah. mean, it, it was just, it was really frustrating. And I think that, that those, those blurry lines in different segments of cybercrime, as well as, you know, principles of, of hacking. I think there leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And mm -hmm. one thing that we like to do as hackers is we like to be right. Um, we, we want to be able to show you the data and show you that we're right. And I think that that's, a, that's another point to, to look at when, when committing cybercrime and opportunity. Sometimes it's not just financial. It's sometimes, like you said, it's I'm smarter than you, and this is why. And I right. want you to recognize that. Right. So what do you consider yourself at, at this point of time? If, if someone calls you a white hat, do you say, well, yeah, okay. It's, it's like profiling with me. Well, not totally correct, but fine if people want to want to put it that way. So do you see yourself as a white hat working on the good side? Or are you still a gray hat? Or what are you? You know, I, I, I haven't been asked that question. And it's a really interesting question. And I, you know, I probably need to take some time to think about that. But, you know, if, with, with what we do with in society today and, and when we, we address men, women, 
children or whatever, you know, with the mm-hmm. different genders and non-fluid and binary and all that good stuff. Um, I, I would say that if I were to classify myself today, I would say I would, I would be a white hat with a very strong magnetic pull towards gray and black. Um, and that's something that, that I deal with on a daily basis. It's not, it's not one of those things where, oh, I just turned my, you know, turned a new leaf and became this different person that, you know, will never be tempted by cybercrime again. But I, I constantly have to think about what would I do in this situation? Because when that situation comes, you're not thinking about it. You're, you're acting. And so I try to go through these scenarios all the time in my head. You know, if I was offered this or I had the opportunity or I found this on your net. What would I do? And I walk myself through the situation. Mm-hmm. And I think right now I'm pretty solid. You know, I, I can't I can't predict the future and I can't predict, you know, socioeconomics or, or even political outcomes of, of different situations. But I think my reaction to the world, um, if I was put in a situation or had the opportunity to make some difference, I don't think that I would let a cyber law come between me and helping a fellow human being. Mm -hmm. Um, At that point, I think I would probably disregard it. But those are the things that I think about. It's not that it's not the the easy, you know, when I break into a bank, of course I would, you know, I enjoy my freedom and and I don't want to go back to that way of life. But then that moral issue comes into play. What, What about that family that had the daughter who was raped killed or whatever and they can't do anything to that to that criminal however you know a hacker somebody else could do something to the entire family or to that person specifically if they get off you know let's say they get off you know hackers chase them down a lot of stuff can happen but i think those are things that that people really need to think about um especially in cybersecurity and people who are ex or former hackers is that you really need to think about those situations plan through in your head because those situations will come up eventually someday interesting so, so what was your motivation yeah, i mean even if it's you interviewing me uh, let's make a conversation because i'm also pretty right. interested in in your sure. background and history so what was your motivation to cross the lines or to come from the dark side to, to to the bright side because we talked about addiction so what was the one factor that stopped you from from i mean for the rest of your life you you could have stayed on that side w- right. without um, uh, b- becoming a white hat or working on that side. So what was your motivation to cross the line or to come to the, to the bright side of life, so to say? For me, pain is a big motivator. Um, and I had never been put into a situation where I felt like I was going to lose all freedom. Um, and to me, that was a really scary feeling. And I was at a, I was at a point in my life where you know, I had family and it, it was, it was a difficult thing to do, but I realized what I was doing was not going to make that, that impact that I really wanted. Um, I knew that, that going in and, and fighting the government on everything that they did, you know, exposing them for, for things that they did was not going to further my agenda. It was just going to put me further at risk. Um, so at that point I, I knew that they were close I, I knew that things were, were going to get really sticky um, so that, that was my motivation, uh, motivation to get into it. I, a lot of people have asked me that. And I, I think that, that my most common answer and, and the things I think about the most, when I think about the beginnings is I was just, I spent a lot of time by myself and, and I really liked electronics and I liked the way that, you know, they operated, but it was so fascinating because it was something you couldn't see. So I wanted to figure that out. So to me, it was curiosity at first, and then it was control. And then it was power. And then you go on a downside. I, th- I think that there's definitely, you know, a biological uh, waveform that goes through any black hat's life. Like th- there's always trepidations. So Inter- interesting because I mean, there is no, I don't use, or I don't like such a thing as a, as a standard profile. Sometimes people also media ask me, well, can you give us a profile of a typical, typical hacker? And the answer is no. I can probably do this about terrorists and lone wolves. Definitely, that there is. If you look at lone wolf terrorism, there was a pretty clear profile. They are young, they are male, they are frustrated, pretty often narcissistic, and they shortly have some losses or failures in life, like losing a relationship, losing a job, or stuff like this. So, if you have a 
young male narcissistic frustrated human being with some failures in life in the last three weeks that's a pretty explosive mixture which in some cases leads to 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 school shootings and 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 also lone wolf terrorism is in this category in cybercrime we don't have such a thing as a standard profile why because cybercrime is such a general term if if we talk about online voyeurism that's a whole different thing than than hacking for money or espionage committed by by intelligence or or um, other companies and and stuff like that so this is really not possible to make to make a, a standard profile so to say and also when we talk about crime as a service we don't talk about individuals. We we talk more about structures operating like companies. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty fascinated that many in many ransomware cases, you have something like customer support, right? <laughs> There's a chat window or phone number where you can call if you have problems paying the ransom in, in, or getting Bitcoin or whatever. Or you can also negotiate, which is pretty interesting. And also there was quality management, <laughs> so to say, because, I mean, if... If they won't decrypt the data, if you pay the ransom, then companies will lose trust in this. I mean, trust is maybe a wrong term when we talk about ransomware and, and stuff. But basically, it's all about this. If, if it would be known that it doesn't matter if you pay or not, you will never get your data back. Well, then nobody will pay. So if you pay, I would say in like 99% of cases, you will get your data back because otherwise they were... they. They will be ruining their own business model in the long term. So they have something like customer support, quality management. And in the dark side case, um, the, the pipeline stuff, you know, th they released something like, like a press release talking about ethics and moral standards. Like these are the kind of companies we're going to hack. And these are the kind of companies or businesses we, we, are, we are not interested in. And I mean, isn't that crazy that criminals are... are making a press release about ethics and company company guidelines it's ridiculous and in no other form of crime i mean you don't have a serial killers association making a press release about ethics and moral standards so so this is unique cybercrime is a unique phenomenon there is no standard profile but there was one study by professor sanders who says um black hatters are thrill seeking mm -hmm. white hats tend to be narcissists and gray hats oppose authority and that's a an interesting classification which works in many cases so yes when we talk about crime it's pretty often about um it's about money but also thrill seeking like you said it starts with curiosity but then in the end it's all about power and and feeling a sense of power this is basically thrill seeking behavior and and intelligence agencies police law enforcement they should never underestimate the power of, of thrill seeking and, and the motivation of um, these people. But it's also interesting that many white hats are narcissists if, or have, have like higher average narcissism scores because yes, let me maybe put it like this. If you have two cybersecurity experts agreeing oh. on, on a point, then maybe one of them is not a cybersecurity expert. So right. pretty really often they think like my solution is the only brilliant solution in the world. And pretty often they have the opinion, well, we should build a totally new system. All the structures which are there are totally useless and have been, have been designed by an idiot and I have to do it myself. So this is, <laughs> on an average, this is a bit like, like, like narcissism or the belief that my solution is the best. And I see this not just in, in IT professionals, but also in lawyers and media people and many other yes. um, industries, but, but, but also in, in cybersecurity, I agree that this might be, might be a point in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really funny because I, I look at white hat and, and security researchers kind of like, you know, this is a very, the, the cybersecurity industry is not very old in relation to other industries, right? Yeah. It's fairly new. And so a lot of the kinks and a lot of the development of our, let's say civilization for lack of better terms, of cybersecurity are just forming and, and those social interactions and, and how we handle things in, within the industry are just forming. So yeah. I, I think within cybersecurity leaders, there's a lot of Darwinism that goes on. So you get a lot of people who put information out that may not be completely accurate, that may be misinformation. And then they meet up with another expert and they, you know, 
go to battle. Well, what we're doing is we're actually thinning that pool to where we don't have, you know, thousands of cybersecurity experts. They start to weed themselves out. You know, the, the strong and, and the, you know, the mentally fit and correct will, will make it through the whole process. But I, I think what we're, we're seeing right now is a lot of jockeying for position when it comes to, you know, cybersecurity and, and white hats. So that narcissism doesn't surprise me because it's a very competitive, uh, I guess, road. And the, the funny thing, though, is that you don't have to have a lot of credit to become one of these experts. You can become one of these experts overnight. However, on the darker side of things, that's not how things work. Like, you have to prove yourself. It's not something where you just jump up and you're super. And I think that's what we lack in cybersecurity is that vetting process and, and that street credential, you know, progression that we see in the, in the underworld. But we just have a lot of people who, you know, jockeying for position and narcissism is bound to take hold for sure. Right. Indeed, it's a very new industry. And also when we talk about um, profiling, it's, it's very interesting because um, there were many studies and a lot of profiling work which has been done in rape cases and also uh, threatening letters and for every category of crime, you have like like a standard procedure. You have data. You have studies. You have criminology. You have you have all that that data. But one reason is also, I mean, if I told you, I I compare basically three groups of of people or offenders: mm -hmm. cyber criminals, corporate psychopaths, and violent criminals. The hardest to get, are, of course, um, the cyber criminals and also people in the corporate world. The easiest to get are the violent criminals. Yeah. Why? Because you know what they did and you know where they are in prison. And they have quite a lot of time and they are quite willing to, 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 to speak about um, their crimes because it can get very boring if you are uh, in prison. But if you are not in prison, so that's like for me a very, very interesting point. If you look at, at criminology... Mm -hmm. and the standard profiles of offenders i always ask myself well how do they know and the answer is they know it from past cases and criminals they interviewed in prison mm -hmm. so the sample is like 100 people who are in prison but what would what would be more interesting for law enforcement and intelligence to learn about one to learn from 100 criminals who are in prison or to learn from 100 criminals who are not in prison and who probably never will be in prison because they are really outsmarting the system and know how not to get caught, right? So these people are much more interesting and they can tell us much more. We can learn much more because these are really the people who, who, who successfully get away with their crimes. And of course, it's difficult to, to talk to them or to read to them, but, but in my opinion... Sometimes I ask myself, what is the motive? Why do the people talk to me? I mean, it's quite a risk. I'm a crime analyst and, and I meet some of them in person. So it's, it's definitely a risk. But in many cases, they are proud of what they are doing, but they cannot really brag about their crimes in real life. You can't go to a bar and say, well, I'm the most unscrupulous hacker you will ever meet in your whole life. Well, you can do this anonymously, but you can never really get credit for this as a person because it's all it's all anonymous. But they are genius in some way. I see hacking as a skill set. Even if it's used on the dark side, hacking is a skill. To kill people is pretty easy. As a serial killer, you don't need any skills. Every idiot can do it anytime. There is no skill involved, but hacking is different. Even when we talk about social engineering, you need soft skills or you need technical skills, but however you do it, you need skills. Mm -hmm. And many of them are proud about what they are doing and, and they like to, to talk about it or tell me how genius they are, which they are in some cases. And, and that's in, in many cases like the motive why they are um, uh, talking to me. And um, yeah, it's, it's just pretty interesting but but let me tell you one thing you said cybersecurity is a new industry and also cyber profiling is totally new there is no data there were not many interviews what i'm doing is pretty unique there were not many studies that said well we met 100 hackers and talked to them so you don't really have that much data and that much information but what what excites me very very much is um 
forensic linguistics and mm -hmm. and using using language as a tool uh, for profiling just let me give you one example i mean we all know what a dialect is a dialect is a regional difference in the way we speak and use language so in different states we have different dialects and all right but there is also something which we like to call in psychology or forensic linguistics an ideolect which is like a personal dialect oh, yeah. so me and you, we, we both have a different ideolect, the way we use language, how long our sentences are, the way we use uh, interpretation, the way we use question marks and, and, and stuff, the way we use language, words, how long our sentences are, is the verb in the beginning or is the verb in the end of the sentence and all that stuff. We all have a different style of, of speaking. And the question is, is there something like a linguistic DNA and the next question is, if there is something like a linguistic DNA or a linguistic fingerprint, how much data or pages or emails do I need to really have an, your linguistic fingerprint and to identify like, like one in a million? And that's really a hot topic. And there, there was enough data to say at this point of time that there might be something like an ideolect, but you need quite a lot of data. But with artificial intelligence and the analysis of language, it's getting better and better. And there was one page, I, I need to recommend this uh, to your audience, on hackerfactor.com. There is a tool which is called Gender Guesser, which is just like, like giving you some insight of, of what artificial intelligence can do. Gender Guesser is a tool which can, which can make a probability statement about your gender just based on five or six words or a short WhatsApp message. So I tried it myself. I, I did type something like, hi, how are you doing? Can we meet today or, or something like this? And it said, well, the probability is 85% you are male. And I tried different, different texts and it always said like between 80 and 90% male probability statement. Then I asked my girlfriend, well, type in something. And she literally did type in, well, hi, how are you doing or whatever. And it said 85% female. In my opinion, it was like almost the same words, but it's interesting. We are not conscious about these differences, mm. but the way we use language is different. Well, if it's possible to profile your, your gender based on five words, then what is possible if I have like 1,000 emails or something? Can yeah. I make a linguistic profile? Can I identify and find you? The answer is not yet, but in, in five or 10 years from now, linguistic profiling in 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 cybercrime will be a very big thing and it's it's just exciting to to yeah. be at the front and and experience what's going on because at this point cyber profiling does not really exist there there is not really something like cyber profiling because it's just in the in, in the beginning this is like basically now what's happening now in cyber profiling is what happened like a couple of years ago what the FBI did about the first serial killer studies and stuff. So this is really a new field just emerging or, or just coming up. And that's really exciting. Yeah. I think it's fascinating because I, I really love the psychology portion of it. And I think most everything, I would say 99.9% .9 of the things we do are driven by psychological, you know, determination, environmental variables that we've experienced while we're developing that, that intelligence or that, that personality. Um, one thing that, that I find really fascinating that, that you brought up was, are you able to determine who somebody is based on text? And I can tell you, when you said that, I, I had to stop and think about it. Like, am, am I that predictable? And I thought about it for a bit. And yeah, like all of my emails and the way that I talk, the way that I talk is exactly how I text or how I, how I send an email. Um, back when I was trying to avoid the FBI, what I did was I just sent everything in Russian to where, you know, it was very nice. difficult to determine who, who it was because I was speaking a dialect that, that wasn't from the country that I'm in. Um, I was speaking with slang from different regions. And I think that plays a big part too is, you know. So you speak Russian or you, uh, you translated it with? Um... Yes. Yes. All the above. So, yeah, so I speak some Russian and was able to hide myself within another language. And I, I think that that was key for me was determining because I knew that the things that they were going to be looking for was patterns, right? So I had to break up that pattern and do something unpredictable. And that's what I did. But with a lot of people, like 
I think if you grabbed not even a thousand emails, if you could grab 50 emails between, let's say me and somebody that I'm personally close to, you're going to see the true communication from me. You're going to see that, that the way that I write is exactly how I talk. And immediately you should be able to pick that up because when I type, I type just like I think and I talk, right? So for a while I'll, I'll be you know, speaking and I'll pause for a second. And in my emails, that's the dot, 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 dot. And I pick up the conversation again because I'm actually yeah. thinking as I'm writing. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, I think it is predictable. I, I can see AI being a great tool for that. But I think the key factor, the key variable missing from that algorithm is being able to pull in those black hat hackers that aren't in prison to subject yeah. themselves to, to that type of research to figure it out. Because here's my thing with, with doing research on inmates and, and people that are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They are a completely different person on the inside than they would be on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, when you don't have the oppression, when you don't have the isolation, you have to adapt and become somebody different in order to survive that yeah. situation. So the, the answers you get on the inside as opposed to on the streets from someone who's, you know, not doesn't have that influence of law enforcement or incarceration. Right. I think you're going to get totally different answers from the same people, just different in different environments. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's pretty interesting because we don't need to start from from zero because mm -hmm. and there was one field which which in my opinion is underestimated or can be very very useful in cybersecurity and this is threat assessment i mean um if people write threatening letters they do exactly what you did like they try to pre to hide their true identity they try to write in a, in a different uh, way sometimes they use other language Many people write like Allah Wakba to make law enforcement believe this might come from uh, from terrorists or in, in radical Islamic background or whatever. Well, in many cases, it's not because people don't write how how terrorists would write a threat. First of all, people who write a threatening letter, in many cases, they don't do it. So, so if, if they threat, they don't do it. And if they do it, they don't write a threatening letter beforehand. If you want to kill as many people as possible, there's no reason to write a letter beforehand to law enforcement to inform them when and where it, it's going to happen. So th that's point number one. But, but there are many, many skills and techniques in, in threat assessment, also used by the FBI and Secret Service. I mean, there were many, many threats against the president like, like every single day. If you would take every threatening letter or message seriously, oh. Biden would never talk in public because you, you, you have to cancel every event or appearance or whatever. So you need to make a profiling or, or a deduction based on the data if this is, if this is serious or not and, and who might be the author of this text. And there are many, many techniques. For example... If you are intelligent, you can pretend to be less intelligent. That's possible, but it does not work the other way around. Anyway. If you're an idiot, you can't write an, an intelligent letter. And also, sometimes people make mistakes on purpose because mm -hmm. they try to, to, uh, to appear a bit more, more, more stupid than they are in reality. But pretty often, it's, it's interesting. When we talk about threatening letters... Pretty often th there are mistakes which are very, very stupid. So simple words like like really and or, or nothing or whatever, there are typos in very simple words. But then when it comes to the threat, which is from an offender's perspective, the part with the threat, like, like that's what I do if you don't pay or whatever, this is for the offender the most important part. And in this part, no mistakes, very clear language, an absolutely perfect uh, uh, spelling and and, uh, and and wording and stuff. So they can write very complicated words, but they can't write the word mom or nothing right. Well, this does not really match. And if you see these kind of, of differences, then you know, well, someone is trying to make us believe that he is or she is uh, uh, not that intelligent, but in, in fact, he or she is. But if you combine this with artificial intelligence and big data, it becomes really exciting. So I think the analysis of language can be a very can, can be a very big thing um, to to maybe identify people or to find out um, who who people are. And also when when we when we think about um, Silk Road and stuff, I mean basically it, it was 
based on, on, on a blog post that finally exposed the whole case. And this can become much more easy if you have tools to analyze big, large amounts of, of texts and use artificial intelligence. But that's, that's a very interesting uh, thing because when we talk about social engineering, pretty often language is involved. doesn't matter if you write a phishing email or a short message or make a phone call or if you negotiate in a ransomware customer service uh, setting, but you're using language. And this can be, um, can be a tool to maybe identify people. I, I just always give this example. The word behavior um, is, is written or spelled differently in the UK or United States. If you come from the United States, you write it with an O and you don't think about it. If you come from UK, you write it with O-U, you. behavior, without thinking about it. For you, it's it's not a, not a big thing, but, but this, then it's possible to make a probability statement about where you're from. And, and this is really, if, if one word is enough to make a probability statement about your country of origin, and if five words are enough to make a probability statement about your gender, well, what can a thousand words do? And that, that's just very, very interesting. And, and if people say, well, this will never work, you, you can't make a personality profile based on 20 words, well, uh, not yet. But in 10 years from now, I think we are now just in the, in the beginning of this, um, in, in this field, and, and a lot of things will be possible now. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I think that, so I'm working with uh, EEMA.org and they're a European think tank on privacy. And one mm -hmm. of the projects they're working on is Locard. And what Locard is, is a system that you can get, um, I guess, evidence and, and uh, case data across different jurisdictions through one system uh, using blockchain. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of technical and technology focus in crime right now. And I think it's really cool. The only thing that scares me, though, is when you do have, when we reach that 20-word, you know, list that will give somebody's, you know, profile, that scares me because what happens when that gets into the wrong hands? Um, anytime that we see, you know, somebody with, you know, nar narcissistic behavior or sociopath or psychopath behaviors or traits, they, they're able to grab that information. They're usually super intelligent, able to analyze it and use it to their ability. Um, I, I think we saw a lot of that during World War II. Some of the most evil people, you know, they, they mapped things out psychologically. They knew what they were doing and they had the tools and the power. And I think that w when we talk about, you know, looking at profiling and cybercrime and the data and data analytics, it almost reminds me of that movie with Tom Cruise, um, Future Crime where they were able to predict based on behavioral analysis and certain algorithms like Bayes algorithms, exactly yeah. if that person was going to commit a crime and their poten the potentiality right. of what type of crime. Um, that totally fascinates me. When that movie came out, I had to watch it over and over again because I thought, how cool would it be to be able to predict that type of thing? But, I mean, there's errors in everything. There's, humans make mistakes. Computers you know, make mistakes based on input. So that type of system, if there's a mistake in that type of system, think of the damage that could happen. If someone got predicted to be, you know, let's say a serial killer or serial rapist, and mm -hmm. the AI or the prediction, the data analysis was completely off. That's what, that's what scares me is when that type of decision making and the power that that data has can change somebody's life. And I think that's where humankind is we're slowly converging on that point where computers and biological life are able to affect each other. And I think that's a, it, it's a great place to be, but it's also a really scary place to be because there's so many things that can go wrong. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And, and not just in the hands of criminals, but also in the hands of intelligence from some countries we don't want. I mean, fighting against crime is always about basically exposing um, people who are anonymous. It's basically bringing people who don't want to be want, want to be seen or found, bringing them to light or, or exposing their true identity. That's what what the fight against crime is all about. But of course, you can also use the same technology to to expose whistleblowers or people in in states that that need to be anonymous. So it's like with the darknet um, it, itself. It has like like good sides and bad sides, but many people depend on on being anonymous and, and not being found. And also publishing 
large amounts of texts like essays or, or books or ebooks or or whatever like the whole whistleblowing um uh, thing in, in many countries depends on publishing or exchanging text if text is suddenly like a fingerprint to identify people well then it it can become for them more dangerous because they could also lose um their their protection yeah yeah, I, I totally agree. And with uh, language, you know, one of the things that we did in the military, uh, looking at encryption, looking at code and uh, cryptanalysis, um, was being able to look at the different dialects and different language and different behaviors in languages and look at, looking at that within coded messages. So I, I think that eventually we're going to see different layers of anonymity. And what I find really fascinating, actually kind of funny, I have to laugh about it, is when some of the anonymizing uh, tools and, and browsers and, and networks came out, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. the, you know, the government automatically thought, oh, criminals, criminals, they're on those networks because they want to hide. Well, right. I mean, look at all the data privacy activists now and, and a big push for data privacy and, and wanting to be yeah. anonymous individuals and, and be a human without traces on the internet. Like, there's a fine balance between what's crime and what's not. And, you know, being able to identify a criminal based on the type of VPN he uses or based on his behavior on the internet really doesn't match up nowadays because now you have to worry about the privacy. The, the people who really value their privacy and their data are going to become that right. anonymous person, or at least I hope they will. So I think we're in an exciting time for, for law enforcement and just being able to figure people out and, and looking at AI and, and the type of data that we need to be able to put together a bigger picture to stop some, you know, some of the malcode and, and some of the malicious people out there. So one question before we leave, um, I wanted to know your most interesting and your favorite person in history based on psychological profile and complex behaviors. Oh, wow. So just, just I think two weeks ago or something, um, someone asked me who would be the one person would you uh, would like to have a, a coffee or a beer with uh, mm -hmm. to interview? Well, the answer would be probably... Um, on the bright side of life, it would be Elon Musk, because I think he too thinks like many hackers in a very different way. His mind works in a different way. And you can clearly see this the way um, he sometimes he gives an interview and he says something which is for 99% of people in the world, pretty hilarious or funny, and people are laughing. And then he looks into the audience sometimes like an alien, don't really understanding why, why people are laughing. He, he's a genius, but his mind works um, in a different way. So he's not a criminal at all, but I think this would be one of the most interesting um, um, interviews. When we talk about, about criminals, there was one case which happened in, in Germany. Maybe you heard about it. Wirecard has been mm. one of our DAX companies. So DAX is like the German form of the Dow Jones. So it's one of the biggest um, uh, companies or banks, basically. And then it it came out that it was basically just a big fraud. So imagine one of the Dow Jones companies is finally exposed and you find out, well, it was just a fraud committed by basically one or two people who were mostly behind it and, and there was one guy who had a very interesting life and he's now hiding somewhere uh, his name is Jan Marshalek or you don't really know if this really is his name right. but but he is like I saw that many interesting behaviors and that would be pretty interesting to have a beer or coffee with him this was would also be pretty interesting I mean just to to give you the short definition like what is psychopathy it's defined by no empathy no deep feelings, no conscience, but also no fear, which is pretty interesting. So all the normal human reactions like like fear, empathy, emotions in general, they don't really have it and they don't really see it. But when we talk about hackers, most of them are no psychopaths, but there are many of them which I would consider more in the spectrum of autism. So yes. they are also a bit their mind works in a different way, but there was a very, very big difference between psychopathy and autism. There was one thing which both have in common. It's, it's a different approach or a different, they don't really have emotions or see emotions the same way that people have them. But there was one difference in psychopathy and autism. Psychopath 
use this for their advantage. The psychopath I talk to, they see themselves, I, I pretty often hear evolution met metaphors. So they tell me like, I'm like a wolf and people are like sheep. And basically I just take what I deserve. So they see emotions like a weak point, a bug, right. an exploit, or, or just a weak, a weakness which people have. And they overcame this weakness, and this is why they manipulate people. But psychopaths have very excellent social skills. So they don't feel the emotions, but they learned to, they to read the emotions and to use them. So basically mask of sanity is, is a metaphor which describes it in a very good way. And autism is different. They also have sometimes problems with emotions, but most of them are not evil at all. They don't want to manipulate or feel power or destroy other people. So in, in cybercrime or hacking, as I said, there is no standard profile. We have psychopaths, but most of them, some people say, well, Mr. Hoffman, I heard one of your keynotes. You talked about psychopathy and cybercrime and stuff. I also have not so many emotions are just... I don't really understand them. I don't feel them. So I think I'm a psychopath. And the answer is no. no. Um, people tell me I'm a psychopath. In most cases, the answer is no, you're not. Because a psychopath wouldn't say that in, in most cases, right? So it's, they are more like in the autism spectrum. But I see autism not as a disorder right. in these times. I see it as a skill. Gift. Yeah. Or maybe an ability. It's, it's just a different way the mind works. But in especially in our time this really can be a skill or should be seen as as a genius talent and not as a disorder it's just for me just that's, that's a good last sentence for me generally speaking the boundaries between personality and disorders who has the right or the power to make a definition what is a what is a character trait and what is a disorder and I think that many things which we might see as a disorder, well, they are unusual. They are odd. That's a matter of fact. But in, in many cases, it's a talent. And they are just genius. And all. Elon Musk would be a very interesting person to talk I, to. But uh, yeah. I have to agree. Um, and interesting you bring up Elon Musk. He's one of my favorite people as well. And I'm not sure if you knew this. I'm, you probably do. But um, he's also on the spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. so that, that's why some of the jokes, like, so I'm on the spectrum as well of Asperger's and, and sometimes people will tell me a joke and I just, I don't get what they're trying to say. Like I, I take things literally. Um, and it's not that I don't have feelings. It's just, I don't understand why people have certain feelings when they have them or yeah. why they have that, that emotion. Like it confuses me sometimes. It's not that I don't understand. I just, mm -hmm. it confuses me that the steps and the reasons why. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I understand people have emotions that I don't have and, you know, relationships could be hard to navigate with that. Um, especially when you're not really in tune with, you know, behaviors or, or emotions in general, and then you have to be close to somebody with, you know, that, that I, I don't want to call it neurodiversity because we're all diverse, but I think with those traits, it's hard to deal with. And I like to use the, the, the term awkward. Um, because that's how I feel in a lot of social, social situations is awkward. And you can see that in people like Elon Musk and his brain, his mind is just so, is so fascinating. And I, I rank him right up there with, with Einstein. Uh, I really like Einstein. He's one of the, my favorite people in history, but as far as dark minds go that I would really love to sit down and talk to would have been Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, mm -hmm. oh, highly, yeah. highly educated, very intelligent. MIT. I mean, just super smart, very right. calculated. Did you read the manifesto? Yeah, I did, and it was really fascinating. Like the, the things he stood for. I think a, I think he was a voice for a lot of people at that time. Um, but he took it to another level, and but he was so calculated about what he did, and and he believed in everything he did, which was to me shocking sometimes because even mm -hmm. going off into cybercrime, doing some of the things I did. Some of it I, I didn't totally agree with, you know, but I did it to fill, you know, a bigger picture. Um, but with serial killers and, and individuals like that, it really it confuses me sometimes why they would do something that they didn't really want to do, but then continued on. Um, right. You know, you, like uh, it wasn't Bundy. It was the, uh, 
the the clown killer. Um, what was his name? I can't remember his Gacy. name. It, John Wayne Gacy. Gacy, isn't it? Gacy. And he was such a master manipulator. And you want to talk about someone who didn't really have emotion. And, you know, he only, you know, displayed like maybe one emotion and that was anger would have been Gacy, but he was so convincing and so sociable. He was your typical black and white definition of a sociopath. And he was and a psychopath. He's just, he was out there and was very bold about it and very congenial and just everybody respected him, but had no idea what he was doing. So that to me, that, that mindset, not the crime. But the psychology yeah. part of it really fascinates me and really draws me to th that those people, along with, you know, I've studied Hitler, and Genghis Khan, and, and some of the really powerful people, just because I think their brain is beautiful. And I think evolution has brought us to a point where we talk about autism, we talk about Asperger's, neurodiversity. I don't think it's a disorder. I don't think it's something that I ail from. I think it's the next step in evolution. I think eventually society is going to move towards this. I guess, genetic wiring of the brain where we kind of pull ourselves out of situations and look at it from the outside in on a black and white basis, a very logical basis. And I, I, think I would not call it a beautiful mind, but I would call it an interesting mind, yes. which, which it is indeed. I mean, talking to psychopaths about emotions, it's like talking to blind people about color. It, I mean, you talk to businessmen, which are really charismatic and they are really, really smart they are very good on their job. They have great social skills and they are master manipulators. But then you ask a very simple question about emotions because they have their conception of emotions. It's like, yeah, there are some positive emotions and some negative emotions, but that's basically it. They don't really understand the different, the, the slight differences and nuances and, and, and stuff between the emotions. So if you ask them, for example, I talked to a girl, it was a, a female psychopath very young girl in a leadership position. And I asked, and, and she was cold as ice. And my last question was, well, do you have emotions? I asked an open-ended questions. Do you have emotions? And she said, yes, sure. Uh, like, like sadness, fear, uh, um, anger. I have all of that. And I said, well, okay. Can you give me for, for sadness? Can you give me any example when you have been sad the last time in your life, or maybe, maybe a big loss in your life? Can you describe to me what, what sadness feels like and her answer was yeah sadness is like missing the bus and that's a very interesting or odd definition so I mean, disconnected I mean, right it's it's not but that's for me this is like the definition what psychopathy is all about that's the concept about emotions like there are there are negative emotions and positive emotions but that's it sadness is missing the bus no sadness if is if you lose your father or your mother that's sadness but not missing the bus so there is a big difference but they don't really understand these differences if if you ask them great businessman great charisma if you ask them please explain to me the difference between friendship and love you get really really strange answers and this is sometimes like their weak point they don't really understand the, the fine differences between the emotions and and that's yeah ju just pretty interesting to talk to them about emotions because they think they know what it's all about but they have no clue if you if you listen to them yeah right fascinating well we've come to the end of the hour and it's been a pleasure it's been a real honor to have you on the show um you know i, I knew when we talked on the conference on the virtual conference that we definitely need to have a conversation and I think we should do this more often. I think the combination, you know, of, of psychology and, and intelligence analysts mixed with, you know, the hacking background and, and that type of insight, we could have a really cool show. I think I think we should do this more often, for sure. Um, think about it. Get back to Absolutely. me. But it was a pleasure having you on. And, uh, you know, for you guys listening, you know, stay tuned. And we have another episode coming up in like three or four days that I have to record. But this has probably been one of my favorite podcasts so far. I've been waiting to have this conversation for a long time. Mark, thank you. And good luck with everything you do. And that's it for us. Appreciate Mike, it. Mike, thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you, man. <clears throat>